And we are live. Wow. We are ready. Good evening, everyone. Good morning. Good afternoon. I don't know where in the world you're coming from, but welcome to the first inaugural live stream. It's quite a place to be. So uh, very proud to be here. <laughs> it's awesome. And I can already see there are 13 people watching. So welcome, everybody. Uh, what I'm doing is currently running on two monitors, so I can read the chat. Bark and Jack, how's it, Adrian? Hope you're well. I'm going to be talking about your watch in a, in a second, so keep uh, yourself posted. Cheetown, California. Oh, good evening, everyone. So what I've decided to do, it's taken me a long time to work this out. Before we even, like, beginning this, 24 watching. Good Lord, this is insane. Um, before even starting, I just want to thank you all so much for you know, liking, subscribing, following this page. Um, you know, it went from 5,000 people to suddenly having 11,000. It's just ticked over 11,000 people. And I know subscribers don't really mean anything at the end of the day, but it is, it's amazing when your work is finally being seen, you know? Wow, this is amazing. From Atlanta, Canada, Czech Republic. Jeez, good evening, everyone. This is insane. So, I had an idea of talking about dive watches. Uh, I thought as an inaugural stream, we would go into something that I know, you know a little bit about. When I say a little bit, Einstein said something about knowing 1% is good enough. Let me know if the audio is okay. I'm running through a headset. You know, I'm not kidding when I say that this setup, I've, I've been in surgical theater before. I've watched open heart surgery, and this is more complicated than open heart surgery. So, Let's have a look. I'm just going to browse this for the moment. Audio is clean. Thank you, Adrian. That is so cool. New Mexico, UK, Pakistan. Wow. Arizona. I love Arizona. I really want to move to Arizona one day, but let's just keep that in the back. Denmark, Holland. Oh, Goedemiddag. Uh, Goedemiddag. I can speak Afrikaans, which is kind of like Dutch slang. <laughs> uh, this is amazing. 42 people. Thank you. The audio sounds cool. Okay, so this is what I plan on doing. Um, I've thought long and hard about this too. I'm going to share my screen and we're going to just run through watches. I'm going to go on Chrono24, go onto Google, scroll through a list that I've made. I've made a list of certain watches that I've highlighted. I planned this a long time ago, but it's just, it's always the execution that matters at the end of the day. And I thought, okay, let's just run through a series, everything from Seiko to Tudor. Blancpain, Omega, Breitling, Panerai, Longines, JLC, and of course, Rolex. And yeah, just how we go. Thomas Burnett, geez, all you guys, it means Luke Jennings. I recognize a lot of you guys. I also need to say, for all the comments that you guys leave on the page, I know that, and I'd love to sit down and dedicate two hours of my time replying to you separately. Uh, but it's very difficult. Oris, I will mention Oris. And I've, in fact, talking about her dinky, we know that her dinky has just released a new Blanc Pan recently. And well, we will talk about that at length. Uh, but we will go into Oris. Let me just add that to the list. Cool. So I don't know how long the stream's going to be. It'll either be an hour, it might be two hours. Who knows? Just sit back, relax. I have some Dutch courage for myself. This is the first time I'm ever doing this. So, of course, nerves, everything. But for some of the experienced veterans, I don't know how you guys do it. First off, I think it's insane. Um, anyway, so this is the plan. I'm going to begin by sharing the screen, flipping the camera to the screen. And I'm basically going to jump between the desktop and Safari. OK, so as you can see where it is at live at the moment, I'm trying to like work out a way of balancing this area out. So I'll have Safari open and full screen. Here we'll be able to look at certain watches that we're talking about. I'd love to hear the comments and you know see what you're keen on. We, as we discuss the watches, I'd like to hear what your thoughts are of them. And I'd like to pause on each watch that we're going through. But at the same time, when I'm reading the comments, I will jump back to the desktop so I can sort of highlight that I'm not looking at the topic. I don't know. We'll see how it goes. This is all on the fly. I don't know. <laughs> uh, 
that's just too cool. I'm not even looking at how many people are watching this, but you know, I expected 10, but there are 55 people watching and that is insane. You know, whether it's 10, whether it's a thousand, it doesn't matter. That's so cool. Okay, so where do we begin? Let's start by talking about watches. Let's just focus on the watch side of things. I'm gonna stop looking at comments for a moment. We're going to go into the first watch, which is the, the hated, the loved Seiko SKX. I did a video about it a while ago, and you know, it's, it's a difficult watch to talk about. There, there, there are pros and cons to it, of course. You know, on the one side, you have a watch that is very iconic for what it does, being a dive watch, being almost a part of pop culture at this stage. But on the other side, you have something that is very complacent. And it's in that problem, when it comes to manufacturing, when it comes to making anything, um, complacency is a problem. So like many have mentioned, I mean, I made a video a couple of, just a couple of months ago talking about the love, why people love the SKX. And I ran through the references, I ran through its past and its present and how it's developed. There are a lot of things about the watch to appreciate, like the fact that it is ISO certified, for example. I mean, that's awesome. But at the same time, it does have a few drawbacks, like the fact that the movement haven't, hasn't been innovated for years. Um, like, for example, the crystal not being sapphire. And we look at the price of these watches. I mean, they sit in the ballpark of about, you know, between, what, $300, 200 pounds. For this amount of money, you can buy an exceptional watch on eBay if you had a bit of common sense. You could find an ETA-powered watch, a watch with a sapphire crystal. So it is, it's quite a conflicting thing, but there are parts about the watch that I do enjoy. Uh, just the distinct nature of the case, first off. Uh, the fact that the case uses a crown guard and a crown set that is offset and not in the center of the watch makes it all the better on the wrist, more comfortable, especially for those who wear the watch on their left wrist, which is you know, a great thing. It's also very distinct, gives the watch a distinct look. Then we move to the dial and we see the details like the, uh, the needle style indices. I'm trying my best to like operate this mouse at the moment. So bear with me guys. I'm, uh, I'm very new to this to say the least. So we have these indices that are needle shaped in the corners and it's, it's quite fascinating how everything works in tandem together. It's, it, it's their way of differentiating themselves from you know, the Submariner watches that we all know and love as well. Then at the same time, adding to that, we have a day date complication. On a dive watch, does that work? That's the question. And on another point, I think one thing that's really nice to add is that the way they've done the bezel, you know, the, the numerals on the bezel are all nice and neat, easy to read, easy to see, executed that very well. Um, okay, I'm going to jump over to the comments quickly because there's a lot of stuff going on here. Jeez, I don't even, I don't even know what's happening. I'm gonna take a water break too because I'm sure I'm going to be doing a lot of talking this evening. This is insane. Yeah, this is what I was talking about. Talking about the movement, the fact that it can't be hand wound, uh, you know, you can only shake it. It's that kind of thing that's a bit of an issue because, I mean, you're paying a lot of money. You can buy ETAs, ETA movements for the same price as a Seiko. So I'd like to know your opinions on the watch overall. And I did want to look at the 009 because there is an element about it that I do like that I think is important to highlight that is not spoken about often. Where's a good example? Um, let's go here. Reserved. Wow, this guy's going nuts. So you can see that the red on the bezel does not take up the majority of the bezel. And I think that is its biggest strength. Where's another? Oh, I want a straight on, a head on picture if I can. Hold on. Hmm. There we go as an example. The fact that the red of the bezel doesn't take up the full bezel is an excellent thing because, as we've seen with the Pepsi and, and most other models that use this configuration, red is a very overpowering color and if you're able to back off that overpowering factor by reducing its overall amount it makes a big difference so it takes you know that it, it gives it a bit more balance in that way and on a practical side when you're talking about a dive watch you need something that generally when you're in the water your, your aqualung lasts between 15 and 20 minutes when you're in the water but um 
the issue, the nice thing about this, the fact that there is a red highlight, it sort of allows you to have a better understanding of how much oxygen that you're breathing is left in the tank. So it's good for dive timing. But you know, there are issues to the watch. I, I don't know if I like the 009 more than 007. It's nice that they're using colors to give it a bit of pop, a bit of highlight. It definitely stands out in a collection. It's a nice, it's a nice color. And I must emphasize again that the font on the bezel is superb. The, the typeface is great. It's so timeless. And that's something that a lot of companies struggle with, which I will cover in greater detail as we go through these, these different watches. But the day date complication, I know it's famous to Seiko. I know it's what Seiko does, but is it, is it that important for a dive watch? That's the big question. Um, amazing. But these comments are amazing. I'm trying to like flip my eyes between, I've got a laptop open to the right of me. So I'm trying to flip between the comments and the big screen. I hope you guys are able to see this all well and the video quality is good. I've really try to think through this. I must have done, I don't know, four or five takes trying to get this live stream fairly decent. You know, you're on the receiving end. So I don't know what you're seeing exactly. Um, but hi everyone. Thank you all for joining again. This is so cool being online and just chatting. I hope you're all sitting back and, you know, drinking something, eating something, enjoying the evening, morning, afternoon, God, everyone in the world. Uh, so question, should we talk some more about Seiko or should we jump to another watch? Because I have a long, let's, uh, actually let's jump to Rolex now because we're all, I mean, I've just seen Adrian, Mr. Bark and Jack himself comment on this discussion, I think. Bouchard Buddha, welcome. Welcome, Chris Cruz, Mark Magnus, Anton Björkentorp. Hope I got that right. Oh, okay, we're getting there. We're getting there. I noticed a lot of, I recognize a lot of your names. Jeffrey Wood, Luke Jennings. Okay, first I'm going to talk about Rolex, and then I'm going to jump to Tudor, because there's one model of Tudor that really, really appeals to me that I hope is the same for you guys. So let's just start from the beginning of Rolex. The, the dive watch segment and talk about the iconic 5508 and really hammer home one point that I think is important that is not spoken about enough. And let's try and find a good picture to work with here. Hmm. Okay, so as we know, the Rolex Submariner has a long, long tenure. And I think that is a part of its charm, the fact that it's been around for so long. Uh, there is, I'm talking about Blancpain just now, so we will be going into that later. But there is one element about Rolex that really fascinates me with their Submariner line, is that the bezel, how the bezel has evolved is really something to take in. Uh, we, we know that these watches are very chintzy and you know, like dress watches nowadays. Uh, and that was, the reality is that was sort of the styling in those days. For those of you who don't know, um, these watches were brought out at a time when there was no such thing as a sports watch genre. You know, and the idea was to create some kind of instrument that could be used in the water. You know, 100 meters water resistant is very impressive as it is, but also something that could be used in a dress in a formal occasion, which in a way is the reason why it's such a nice fitting watch for James Bond. You know, it has the it has that that function to it that has that nice blend, you know. So it's a really interesting watch. But one thing that's equally important is just realizing and you know talking about the size is one thing but then talking about just the bezel and how you know small the bezel is in retrospect to what it is now and i will run through the references as we're going uh, it's amazing uh, and that, that really plays a part in how this watch has changed you know the bezel was you know an element of the turnograph that was basically amalgamated into a dive wash they didn't know what the bezel would be used. They didn't know if it was going to be popular or important, but it's, it's amazing development because as we now move through the years, I mean, this is a stunning watch. 5508 is very iconic. They're all price on request. I can't imagine how much they cost, six figures maybe. Let's move to the 5512, which is one of the Submariners that I really, I think it's one of the coolest Submariners around, around mainly because of the bracelet, the bracelet and the end links is really, really something cool. Talking about hating the Cyclops. Yeah, I agree. Hate the Cyclops too. Um, it's never been a thing. It's never been a favorite of mine. And I'm going to eventually get to Adrian's new purchase and just talk about how cool it is because it really is 
such an awesome watch. It's something you can't really deny is a really cool piece. So the 5512, just being that, that further development, I talk about it in a few videos, I, I can't remember. Over the last three months, I've made 40 videos. So you can imagine it all sort of blurs together at a stage. Here's a better example. One thing I really love about these vintage pieces is the way that the end link blends in with the bracelet. Gotta admit, it looks, looks so cool. Um, and the rivet style bracelet, I know a lot of people don't like it, but it's just, there's something about it that I enjoy. I'll even buy faux rivet bracelets just to get that, that charm. But notice how the bezel has changed over this period, how all of a sudden the bezel is prominent and the watch has basically formed the iconic shape that we all know and love today. Pretty amazing. Um, and the crown guards, the story behind the crown guards is fascinating. I mean, this, this is an old reference. What do they say? This is a 66. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but the idea with the crown guards was that they went from, you know, from pointed and eagle beak, and there's a whole series of references about the crown guards. This looks like a more modern version of 5512. Fascinating looking thing. And as we now jump through the generation, do I need to mention the 5513? I don't know. It's pretty much the same watch. It's just slowly but surely developed. We might as well, since we're going through the, the icons of the family. You know, the 5513 was just a development, uh, better movement, and all the rest. Also, a stunning watch. And of course, some pictures are going to be worse than others when it comes to resolution and all the rest. Um, but they are really something. I hope you're enjoying this. I'm trying to like treat it as if we were all sitting together looking through a magazine, you know, <laughs> and we're just paging through, drooling over all these things that we many of us won't be able to afford in our lifetimes but hey it's cool to dream just because we don't own enzo ferraris doesn't mean we can't enjoy them i mean these are stunning some of the things they got rid of on the 5513s if i remember right was the uh, the minute track sort of change they didn't have a rail a rail dial minute track if i remember right um oh geez and then we go to the mill sub i mean this thing i'm going to be talking about a similar watch related to the mill sub just now and it really is something cool. The, uh, just the, it, it's, it's all in the details. I think that's what we all favor so much. I mean, if Rolex had to produce a modern version of this with sword hands and you know, a tailored case, a tapered down case, I think people would, would go mad over this thing. I think it would, you know, as it is, Rolex is sort of a company that, uh, you know, they're complacent, very complacent. They're not really keen on the whole innovation side of things but at the same time their property is just untouchable by anyone else and yeah it's mind blow so this is a very early reference if i remember right because of these crown guards these square crown guards are quite unique to the watch i might be wrong here um you know i'm learning just as you guys are i'm just trying to pull together what i do know such a stunning watch really dig it i love the crystal anyway we've spoken enough about the older references. Let's talk about something that is new, near and dear to our hearts. The 14060. Now, whether you like Rolex or not, this is like almost a certainty. This watch, come, this watch comes so close to perfection, if I put that in italics. Um, because, and I think the reason why it is so popular and why it makes such a splash <laughs> is because rolex really likes to be spare with their watch or they used to be very spare with their watches and now um they've slowly but surely blinged them up and made them more and more you know catered for a different audience but these watches this model especially the final hurrah the swan song for the submariner i don't think it gets any better than one of these you have all the modern components that you would want but at the same time has the vintage aesthetic, the vintage feel. I love the spacing of the loom plots and everything else. I've handled a few of these before and it's just a mind blow. But there's one watch that I think pips it overall that we will get through to in the end and it will come up just now. Um, but the 14060, it's just, it's an icon, it's simple. Adrian, you, we cannot, Mr. Bark and Jack, sir, we cannot tell you that this was a bad choice. There's no way, you could have, I mean, of all the watches that you brought out that you brought out on that that video that you recently released 
14060 is just one of those watches that is timeless, will always be timeless. Even if you hate Rolex, you cannot hate this watch, I don't think. There, there is nothing to say that this watch is, is terrible. But apart from four lines, I'm not such a fan of the four lines. Uh, I think two lines works better on this model. Uh, as a Berthier watch, the 14060 falls into my, into my field. And oh, I'd love to get one of these one day. So to anyone who owns one of these, do not get rid of it. That, I mean, that is just, again, it's, it's that final watch that really sung before Rolex went modern. And uh, now talking about modern, let's go to the one watch that I really like in their modern lineup, the six digit. Now, I've spoken about this at length, about super cases and everything else. And there's a lot of theories, there's a lot of discussions about why, I'm just trying to find a good picture. Ooh, that's a goodie. There's been a lot of discussions about why they went with the super case in the end. There's a few reasons. A designer can give you a opinion on why they went this way. We know that Rolex has always been about incrementally improving their stuff. That's always been their forte, that's the name of the game. That, that'll never change. But what they did with this was take the format that they had. I mean, they already had an established format of a 40 millimeter dive watch and said, why don't we just improve the parts we wanted to improve, like the aluminum bezel replacing it with ceramic. But the big jump was to the super case. In a nutshell, increasing the super case, increasing the size of the super case is a few things. First, you're keeping the watch at the nominal 40 millimeter size, which is excellent for everyday wear. But at the same time, what it, so, so that means that you're not alienating your audience, you know? Uh, at, a, at a 40 millimeter size, many more people can wear this watch, whether they have a six and a half inch wrist, seven inch wrist, eight inch, it works great. The presence is increased, but it's not oversized. But at the same time, when it comes to servicing, and I'm sure they basically learned this from experience, Rolex realized that because of excessive polishing on the cases, the lugs virtually disappear. So what this package does essentially is allow for this watch to last, you know, an eternity and more because the lugs, when it comes to polishing, I mean, the lugs being double the size they are now, uh, they, will, they will polish twice as much and will go long into the future. Same with the ceramic bezel, same with the way the dial has been arranged. No more tritium dials. It is sad. I mean, we all deep down, if, if we like modern watches, we also have a, a pull, a pull towards vintage pieces. So really the increase in size of the case was to increase longevity. It's not a bad watch. I mean, geez, you think about what they've done to improve just this section here, just the clasp. Yeah, that is a marvel. I mean, that is a lot of work, a lot of research and development to suddenly bring the case, this, this style of watch out, this new complete, you know, this unveiling happened in around 2010, if I'm not mistaken, to bring this whole format out, not just having one piece remedied, but having such a, a massive overhaul to the watch must have made a big splash. People must have really been impressed. So, I mean, me personally, as, a, as someone who prefers the smaller cases because I have a, a fairly small wrist, I, I don't know, the super case is, is cool. I've tried these on too. Got a funny story about how I, uh, <clears throat> my cousin was visiting, visiting me once. I took him into Harrods. It was quite a, a quiet day and uh, basically said to the sales guy, it, you know, it wasn't busy. It was before things really picked up when it came to, you know, the Daytonas and everything else. I went into the boutique with my cousin and said, we've just scored a massive business deal and we want to celebrate. And uh, after trying on a solid gold Submariner, I think my cousin tried on a, an Explorer 2, the, uh, the 42 mil version. He basically said, is there anything more you can offer us? And this guy was nice enough to actually take us back and show us a series of other watches. I don't think the Pepsi GMT hadn't been released yet, but um, Ceramic Daytona was there. That was a really cool experience. Anyway, getting back on track. I don't know, it's a mixed bag. Love it and hate it, I think, overall. The, uh, this, the, the modern Submariner, I mean, you cannot deny it. it's an excellent watch. It has all the same attributes as the vintage piece, but uh, it could be, you know, I'd love for the 2020 piece to be released and they use a similar format of 
tapering down the lugs like they've done with the new Batman and the new Pepsi GMT, putting the new 72 hour power reserve movement in. Um, and like I've seen, I've seen a few comments on the side here, no date Cyclops. I think, I think it just, it's so clean. It, it just, it is the Submariner. And I think that is the way a true Submariner is. Um, I don't know. There's just something about the date complication that doesn't appeal to me, but now that we've just spoken about that, there is one watch that I think pips all of these that we've just spoken about, and it is the 16600. Now, what about this watch is so cool at first? I have mistaken a lot of people wearing this watch for it's just to be a Submariner. And you, it's normally always the case. We, a lot of us can be guilty of it because it looks just like a Submariner, right? There's nothing, nothing big and blase about it, but then suddenly when the watch has been turned over, all of a sudden you see a little helium release valve. You see that the crystal is a bit taller, the case is a bit taller. This to me is the, the Submariner. It's, it, it, it's better than the general Submariner. I think it's just, it's got that element. I spoke about it in an old video about, uh, in quotations, the problem with the Sea Dweller design. And I spoke about how the modern sea dwellers have sort of varied off this path of being stealth. You know, let me just try and open up a separate tab. I'll just jump to Google and type in sea dweller 43. Just look at it. Now, don't get me wrong. The sea dweller 43 is it's a superb watch. It is a watch on, it's literally a watch on steroids. But it's sort of lost that pull that the sea dweller had originally. You know, um, losing, you know, adding a Cyclops to it all of a sudden, it just, the language of it disappears. I think the whole, the, the dream about the Sea Dweller was always to be, uh, let's think of a good example. You know, you have a standard 911 Turbo, but you have the RS package inside it. You don't need to tell people that you're wearing this fancy, this really ridiculous dive watch. You have something that is subtle, um, but just so killer. The date complication being without a Cyclops lens is just that a kind of example. It doesn't need it. Now, of course, for, for aging eyes, of, of course, it's important. But I think just the symmetry, having it nice and clean, some of these photos are insane. I really, this is one reason why I like using Chrono is because the photos are superb. This watch is based, this watch is new old stock. Well, for the low price of almost 11 grand, holy Moses, you can get your hands on a five-digit sea dweller. And there's just something about this watch. I don't think this model has papers, which is why it's pretty affordable. There's just something about this watch. This is the last of the line, and you can normally tell by the, by the end links being solid. There's just something, something else about it. There's just that little added touch of cool. You know, just the, the hint of a, of a helium release valve. I know it's, it's ridiculous going into the water to 300 meters. But just saying that you have something that winds up the next watch with a little tiny valve on the side is awesome. And just the space. Look at, look at the, the attention to detail of how they thought about the space and allocation of the helium valve to the case. The top hat crystal, I mean, it looks so awesome. Cannot deny that it is. It's the stealth Submariner. Really think it's awesome. Okay, we're just blazing through these watches. I'm going to try and like return to the chat and I don't know if I should leave. I think I'll leave a picture up and find a good picture to look at while I read some of the chats. I don't even think I'll be in touch with the chats this evening. I'm just browsing through 125 people watching. Jeez, 123. <laughs> well, that was, that was quick. Everyone, thank you for joining. Uh, I thought this would be a nice time to try and take a break from my usual 12 plus hours of um, recording and writing and getting a, a video edited up. And this would be a nice break to be able to just sit back, relax, talk about watches, run through a series of dive watches. If you're just joining, we've basically run through the entire catalog of Rolex dive watches, you know, from the Submariner to the, uh, the Sea Dweller that we've just finished with. And now we can go into something else. And the next watch, okay, this is going to be cool. We're going to go into Tudor, but we're not going to talk about the Black Bay. We're going to talk about the one watch that I think has to be one of the best designed dive watch dials ever. 
it's quite a big, it's a bold statement, especially I was talking about Rolex. So the Tudor Snowflake, why do I say that it is such an interesting dial design and layout? Now, the, the thing is, what, what's interesting is that when it comes to creating something, any kind of creative process, uh, you don't have much time to really sit and ponder and you know, think about life and, and you know, inspiration and what's coming next. You sort of just have to commit to it. Interesting thing about this listing. You see what it says here? Tudor, South African Navy, military snowflake. This watch is exceptionally rare. I'm from South Africa, by the way. I hope you kind of worked it out by my accent. But um, there's a story that goes that Mill subs and Tudor subs especially were issued to the South African Navy, and they have to be one of the rarest watches in the world because there are just so few of them. And coming from my side of the world, Africa, there's not much knowledge about the subject of watches. So it's quite fascinating. This watch itself is a very rare model. I'm sure it has some kind of interesting hallmark and insignia. So going into the design of the Snowflake, uh, like I was saying, oh, I need to take a breath. <laughs> Talking so much. Um, see Dweller on my wrist. This, there are so many comments. I won't be able to keep up with the comments. I think one of these evenings, I'm just going to have to sit down and just read through. We've got a Burkhardt Spurk. How's it put? <laughs> if I got that right. <laughs> um, so, the interesting thing about the development of this dial, so you can kind of piece it together. Rolex released their, their Submariner line, and Tudor, being the, the cheaper alternative, had to release a line of their own. And I'm sure they hummed and hard for a little while, but suddenly they decided, okay, let's just commit, drop these indices in, out the door it goes. But it, they've really done something with this. The fact that there is so much, what's the best word to explain it? Symmetry. Um, Congruence is a better word, I would say. The fact that you have squares linked with rectangles, you have a square in the second's hand, square in the hour hand, but what centers your eye is that triangle in the center of the dial. It makes it so much more legible at a glance. And the interesting story is I've read at least that uh, the military favored these over most submariners in general because they were just so much more legible. And we, we spoke about the mill sub briefly this has that legibility that you want. It's so easy to just, if you just have to look away from the screen and jump back and uh, try and tell the time, it's so quick and easy to do. But the joke is this design, this, this language of having squares on the dial, it's so 70s, you know, late 60s, 70s. Um, it's fascinating, fascinating development. Very interesting watch. And this one especially, like uh, if you haven't heard already, South African... Navy military snowflake has to be one of the rarest uh, watches around in, in this mill sub genre. There was an excellent video done by Hojinki a couple of years ago. I think it was, what was his name? He had a whole series, the 12, the 12 submariners of, uh, name slips my mind now. Ah, uh, anyway. So just in, in contrast, if we now look at uh, Oyster Prince, just the standard dial, the smiling face, the smiling self-winding. It looks great. Uh, the Mercedes hand is a little bit tiring at times, but you know, you have circles trying to work out this mouse. You have circles, you have rectangles, you have everything. It's sort of, it's there, it's easy to read, but it also has a bit of a clash in places. And then we jump out of this and we look at the squares and the triangles. I hope you can see what I mean when I say it is just so much more Mm, what a beautiful photo. It's so much more easy to read at a glance. At least that's how a designer would put it. I mean, what do I know? <laughs> oh, geez, there are so many comments here. I hope I'm not missing anything extreme. Graham Fowler, that's it. Well done, Caleb. Thank you. 13 mil subs of Graham Fowler. It's a really awesome video. I mean, if you want to watch collection, that's the way to go, man. I mean, geez. He has, he has uh, and then he's wearing a white gold Submariner on the wrist, casually, you know, the, the Smurf. It's too cool. So really, I'd be interested in, in hearing your thoughts about the Snowflake and whether you think, check at that crystal, whether you think the Snowflake has a better dial layout or whether it is just my imagination. 
that would be interesting to hear from you guys. Chitan, California, would you have a Pelagos over a Black Bay? That's an interesting question. Very interesting question. The Pelagos, you know, it was their way of kind of modernizing the snowflake design, which is interesting. I'm, I'm going to pull up a, uh, a Google page for this. There's one thing that the Pelagos does better than so many models, and that's its bracelet. So uh, let's just look at that quickly. I love, I think this, for a technological marvel, well, I wouldn't say marvel, but a technological step forward, this is a fascinating idea. And it's something that you seldom see. I'm going to be talking about Omega just now, and there's one element that I would love Omega to incorporate that used this kind of system. So the Pelagos bracelet is superb, but let's now look at the watch itself. I wear my watches on my right hand, so the question is, should I have a left-hand drive or, or not? What I do like about the Pelagos is the, is the dial, the way that they've actually sunk in the, the minute track around the numerals, it's very interesting. They've sort of modernized it, but they've also kept it kind of vintage with a creamy, creamy loom. I mean, that's, that's such a beautiful shot. Who is this? Fratello watches. They do some awesome, awesome stuff. Um, but the issue is, I find it a bit big. <laughs> I'm not really someone who enjoys 42 mil watches. I don't know if that's the size of this. I think it is 42. I've always been someone who's, who likes the idea of 40 mils. For my wrist size, 40 mils fits so much nicer, at least. But um, And when we look at the Black Bay, the Black Bay 38, what was it, the 58? The Black Bay 58 is an interesting looking watch. And you compare the sizes between these two watches. It's pretty amazing, the, the, the drop in size. I know a lot of people hate them, but I really, really dig rivet bracelets. And uh, I, know, I know Adrian for sure doesn't like them. I remember seeing in this video talking about the Harrods edition, I think. Um, so I really do like the rivet bracelet on the watch. And, and just the idea, I, I really like the notion, as we go into Omega just now, I'll talk about one watch that really speaks to me that I've, I've tried on and worn extensively, and it is amazing. Um, I like the vintage touches that they do, the box sapphire crystal. I'm kind of a sucker for vintage inspired watches actually. I don't know what it is. I think it's nice when watches can actually stick to their, you know, their timeline, their heritage, amalgamate modern with old school. I think it's a nice, it's an interesting flair. And I've said this a couple of times, you know, it's clear that, that um, Tudor has been given the creative limelight from Rolex. Rolex is sticking to their standard forte of producing what they do and Tudor is allowed to do what they want. So adding the gilt, you know, adding the, the pencil styled hands and all these little touches, I love, I think the rose is, is much nicer than the shield on the watch too. Uh, some of the newer references are awesome. And depending how the stream goes, I'd love to do a chat maybe on, on Friday about chronographs or maybe even Saturday, because as we know, Saturday is quite a monumental day for a certain Omega. So, Covered Tudor, would I, would I choose the Black Bay or would I choose the Pelagos? Hmm. I would prefer the Pelagos style dial on a Black Bay case. I think that would be something that would appeal more. Watchfinder covers all of this so well. So, I mean, everyone here knows about Watchfinder. <laughs> so if you're interested in looking at more details about these watches, then go for them. Um, interesting about the Black Bay Harrods. I've spoken at length, we might as well talk about that quickly because I've spoken at length about the Hulk Submariner. I really, really don't like the watch. And it, it was one of like the worst videos I could have released because it was, everyone went ballistic when they said, when I said that I didn't like it. It's almost like I attacked their souls when I said I didn't like the watch. Uh, things like the ceramic bezel and these little elements to the watch and going into, we're going to be talking about the, the Black Bay Harrods edition just now. Um, the bezel to me is too bright. You know, it, in certain lights, I've seen these in the flesh as well. In, in certain lights, they just, you know, they either go flat or they're, they're too reflective. And it's a difficult thing. Dealing with ceramic, you know, it's all down to the glaze at the end of the day. That is the thing that ties it all together. If you have the right glaze, you're pretty sorted when it comes to the coloration. And uh, could they have improved this bezel is the question. Could they have 
you know, matted it instead of polished it, glossed it. Yeah, exactly. Um, but one thing about this watch that is a cut above the rest. I mean, the only watch that comes close to this watch in dial territory is the, the Milgauss Z Blue, in my opinion. This green dial on this watch is just, it's just another level. Beautiful. And Rich Buddy says with a green strap, rubber B green strap, that would be cool. Nice combination, I think. It's always nice to pair watches with a with a similar color, of course. Um, so good. So the, the, so the Hulk for me, I really don't like the bezel. The bezel looks, I mean, that kind of light, it looks cheap as, I don't know if that's just my eye, but it really looks, mm, you know, could be better. But the dial on these watches are just something else. I mean, look at that. Emerald green. I mean, emerald is the color you always go for. You never go bright green. You never go like dark, dark, olive drab. Emerald is superb for that watch. And now jumping to the Kermit, another watch that Adrian has that I uh, hope he doesn't take it badly when I say that. Oh, this watch again. I know that this, this, uh, this scheme celebrates the 50th anniversary, if I'm not mistaken, the 50th anniversary of Rolex. And of course, Rolex green is a big thing. But the green is just, again, too green. <laughs> it is better having it this way than the polished, uh, you know, polished ceramic case. Oh, sorry, the polished ceramic bezel. But again, the green and black to me just sort of clashes. In the, in the video that I did about the Hulk Submariner, I tried to do a little mock-up render where I sort of took the black dial and made it a little bit uh, more green, you know, a flat, a flat green made a big difference it's an awesome watch i mean geez you can't go wrong with this i mean it's a collector's item for sure I, I would never sell something like this it is something you want to keep for years because 50th anniversary means a lot more than a 60th anniversary let's be real it's half a century 60th is sort of like okay you've come over the hump but now you know, it's, it's not as special anyway uh and now going now to the tudor variant which is the Tudor Harrods Black Bay. Now this watch attacks it better with a more, much more toned down bezel. And I think for a dive watch, especially, you want something that's toned down, you know, nothing bright and in your face. And I think this works perfectly. You know, it's not dark. It's not, it's not reflective, nice and matte, matte dial. No, a light cream patina to the to the dial, the, the loon plots. Um, amazing. And and timeless capital, founder timeless capital. Congratulations on that 1655 Rolex. That watch, that is my dream watch. It, it is absolutely my dream watch. Uh, geez, but when they when they're costing around, I just want to jump to it because for those of you who don't know, I mean this watch is just the dream. Absolute dream. Hello, that's not a 1655, come on. How do we jump to five digit references? There's an example. We look at the price of this, people, 21,000 pounds. I mean, that is insane. <laughs> For a watch that wasn't even appreciated back in the day. I'm going, on a, I'm going on a tangent talking about this watch, but I have to. I mean, this thing deserves a video all to itself. Um, hell, it's a cool looking watch. And the best part is what I like so much about it, and I think what most people would like is that it is not, it doesn't look like a Rolex. It doesn't look like your typical, you know, Submariner. It doesn't have your typical, like what, what your modern, modern GMT looks like nowadays. Beautiful dial, beautiful layout. And uh, practicality wise, I think it's excellent. It has a date complication on this watch and this watch alone. I respect everything that goes on, you know, the dial. The, the uh, Cyclops doesn't bother me on this watch. Nothing about it bothers me. It's, it's strange. It's got that simplicity, but that complexity about it that is fascinating. When you think about what it's used for, a watch being you know, taken to the poles, um, taken into caves, that is so cool. Okay, getting away from topic, I had to talk about this because it really is something cool. Um, the next watch that I wanted to look at, what was it? I'm just going to jump back to, to the comments. And as we do, I'm just going to leave you on a glorious little creamy patina. Oh, it's beautiful. 
the Black Explorer 2 is underrated. Absolutely. Nicholas Evanet. Evanet? It is, it is really sick. Actually, let's see if there's one here for us. Let's look at it. It's very, and, and again, it's very understated, and I think that's what gives it its charm, right? <clears throat> being, being this size as well, that's a terrible picture. Being the size at 40 millimeters, not having a black bezel brings its presence down a lot too. So it's a lot more understated on the wrist. Awesome photos. Trying to navigate with this mouse and it doesn't always like me. Very cool watch. So I'm just gonna leave that up here for the moment. Uh, Thomas Burnett, your video on the 1655 is a real eye opener. Yeah, it is, it is a stunning watch, Tom. It's really something. Love it. Um, and and this, this watch really is something cool. I should, I should point out, if I had a choice between the two, that's the real question. I mean, as we know, black dials look smaller than white dials you know, on the wrist. And I'm not the kind of person who really wants something that is expressive and, and loud as a white dial. But at the same time, with its bezel being steel, it brings the presence down all the more. This is a sad thing when they have service hands on a, oh, it's a sad story. It's like, hang your head in shame. <laughs> Oh, stunning though. Uh, and the 42 millimeter model, I would like to talk about at a later stage. I, I've worn it, I've tried it out a couple of times and it just doesn't sing, at least for my wrist. I think that's the problem. It's the dial proportions relative to my wrist. It just doesn't, it looks too big for me at least. So would I choose a Citizen or a Seiko over an entry level Swiss, over an entry level Swiss watch? Good question. The, the reality is I don't have much uh, experience in the field of Seiko or Citizen to really give you a good answer of that. Um, but talking about value for money, you might have a better option getting a, I would take a Seiko over Citizen, I think. Now Citizen, if I'm not mistaken, is owned by Seiko, if I remember right. Um, but I might be wrong. <laughs> This is all a learning experience. Uh, what I do generally when it comes to preparing for videos, I like to study a lot more about the subject before going into it and talking about it in length. Okay, now we're jumping to the, uh, the competition to Rolex and Tudor. Why does it always do this? I always miss out on A on Seamaster. Right, let's just run through these watches because you know, you can't talk about the Submariner without talking about the Omega Seamaster. The original professionals, <clears throat> nowadays they look quite dated. It has to do with a bracelet. And just after looking at the Submariner, I think, I think that this watch just tries that little bit too hard to innovate in places. You know, the, the crown guards, you know, there are some awesome things about it. We will, we will look at that. But the skeleton hands, I know they're, they're a, a bane to many people. There's a lot of conflict about the skeleton hands. Um, the batons, it looks good. It's very unique. I really appreciate the fact that they blacken out the date wheel. Date wheels need to match the color of the dial. It just makes it so much more streamlined. And uh, But then again, on some models, it works out well in tandem with the batons. So, uh, But the bracelet, <clears throat> I've also worn these a couple of times before. The bracelet, uh, you know, it has that sort of blend between a, a Jubilee and an Oyster. They, uh, they tried hard to bring out this watch in the 90s. And I mean, it was successful. Talking about value for money, I don't think you get better. As an entry level Swiss watch, I mean, this is what you could basically factor this in as. I don't think, well, this has a, I'm pretty sure this has an ETA movement inside it. But it really is, it, it's good value for money, what you're getting. It'll last a lifetime easily. And the model standing next to it, which I really like, is, I think this is a mid-size, um, this guy. This is a very interesting piece, purely because it has that <clears throat> mil sub quality to it. When I say mil sub, I mean, you know, military spec uh, Seamasters from back in the day. But there is one issue about it that plagues me. I wanted to actually talk about it in the video. The bezel on this watch. How can you have such a clean dial? I mean, look at that. That has got to be one of the cleanest dials around. It's stunning. The date wheel being the same color as the dial, it looks, it looks so cool. But then you jump to the, the, the bezel and you have these 
ginormous numerals on it and it just it dates the watch it doesn't it doesn't look modern anymore you know it, it kind of has this oh, whoops whoops hands here we go we're back we're back ladies and gentlemen uh it doesn't have that modern flair to it but then if we look at the older references you know the older seamasters that had the the more standard bezel layout those numerals are a lot better a lot easier to read wouldn't you say i think these numerals are much better they work so much better on the watch i don't like the fact that they've misbalanced it without the 10 over here i mean that's nitpicking i mean everyone to their own uh, this is a james bond edition i think i think it came out during the time of um casino royale if i'm not mistaken but again they the, the james bond affiliation it's nice but they are going a little bit overboard with their references. Some are awesome. I mean, I love the Aquaterra version. It's one really cool example. Um, but also the helium release valve, Scott SJ, thank you for joining. Thank you so much for commenting on all the videos in the past. Uh, is the helium release valve necessary? I, uh, I think it, it adds to the charm of the watch, really. How many dive watches can you say come standard with a helium release valve? It's very superficial. It's very irrelevant because i mean you don't need it at all I, I doubt even the professionals would use a helium release valve at certain depths but it does add character to the watch a little bit of asymmetry doesn't hurt um the question is could it not be better placed like could the valve not be moved from you know the the 10 o'clock position and moved just below the crown for example i don't know and that's the thing that's kind of what uh, the thing about design generally is questioning why why is it the way it is should the valve be moved removed completely and i've done i've played around with it before removing the crown i mean removing the the helium valve and it looks a bit plain actually it looks a bit standard you know um breakers up thank you so much for for joining i hope to do more of these depending on how well this goes and whether you guys like it mt bone thank you for joining i know you were you were busy and this is like midday in the states so thank you for for joining us uh, we might as well just jump to the Proplof as well. I mean, why not? We're talking about Seamasters. This thing, whoops, how do you spell it? Pre Proplof. <laughs> this watch is, is really like, it's so strange. And this is the modern variant. I don't think we'll be able to find any vintage pieces. This model is, is like, it's just 70s personified, wouldn't you say? I mean, if, if anyone wanted to rush something out the door, like they rushed out the Monaco, I think they, they rushed this out the door quite prematurely. I mean, you look at that case. What were you thinking, man? <laughs> you know, it's very strange. But at the same time, it does have that, uh, that pull to it of being this ultimate dive watch. Having this button to depress the crown, you know, the, I mean, the, the bezel as a ratchet, it's a nice system. I'm, I can't say I'm much of a fan of, of a shark mesh, mesh bracelet. I don't really think it, I don't know. I've never worn one, so I can't tell you that I like wearing it, but I'll say it doesn't really appeal to my inner dive watch enthusiasm. And then these are the latest ones. I think this was released this year. I mean, it looks like a Richard Mill, wouldn't you say? Hmm, conflicting. Very strange, very, very peculiar. <laughs> what is nice is the, uh, the minute hand and how it corresponds with the pusher and how the pusher corresponds with, I hope you're seeing this, let me just pull it closer. How the minute hand corresponds with the pusher, how the pusher corresponds with the bezel. That's very good color theory. Gray and orange is a perfect combination. It's very um, neutral in a way. You have a highlight, but at the same time, I mean, you think about it, all of the parts that are highlighted here in orange, are all dependent on dive dive related activity that is brilliant that's the kind of thing that you want to want to look at jacques cousteau wore it andre very very cool yeah i mean jacques cousteau was one of those divers i think he had a rolex submariner that was put on auction recently i might be wrong but he uh I th he did make this watch famous if i remember right during his expeditions um but yeah, this thing is just, it's, it's very gaudy. It doesn't, <laughs> doesn't exactly work for me. Uh, and then we were talking about the CMOS Professional. Let's now go back a few years. 
and talk about one watch that really speaks to me. Once again, I make a mistake with spelling Seamaster. There must be something wrong with me. The 300, just the, the standard, you know, the James Bond version. The question is, was this a good watch to bring out for uh, James, the James Bond film? Was it, it wasn't Skyfall, it was Spectre, if I remember right. Was this a good watch for him? One thing that bugs me about the watch that I'm sure bugs a few people is the, is the bezel. Oh, come on, mouse, work with me. Why would they put a GMT bezel on this watch? I don't even know if this is a GMT bezel. It'd be nice if you could correct me in the comments. Um, it's just strange. I mean, the bezel does match up to the numerals, but then when you look at the three, six, and nine, you have three, six, and nine on the bezel again. And it's, mm, I don't know, doesn't do it for me. I, I, I don't really, don't really, it doesn't really appeal much. But one watch that does, that I've had extensive wear time with and I've enjoyed the hell out of, is the 57, the 1957 Trilogy Tribute. Now this watch measures at 38 mils. If you see this watch in the flesh, your eyes will probably pop out your head because the proportions are just something to marvel at. They are, oh, they are so good. And on the wrist as well, it's something special. And I think talking about Tudor and the, uh, and the Black Bay, God, this thing is really, they really nailed it. If you don't know the story behind it, they took it into MRI machines, they x-rayed it, they pretty much got this watch exactly the same with regards to its case and its build to what the uh, the 57 model was like. And geez, it is something else really cool. I mean, just the, the, the details, the, uh... anyway, let's try and zoom out. I'm trying to work this mouse and it sometimes cooperates and not. One part that really sticks to me that I enjoy the most is that this clasp, as I'm sure we're all aware, this clasp would have been stamped in the 50s, you know, stamped out of steel, just pressed, stuck on the watch. So what they did, instead of like taking that idea away, they even left the little thumb tab on the Amiga logo on the clasp. They milled it out of steel. They added the pushes on the side to open it up. And I, I they did talk about the Pelagos and how I wish they incorporated a similar kind of element from the Pelagos in this watch with you know, some kind of gliding mechanism so that you could actually use your fingers almost like triggers to open up the clasp instead of pushing the buttons down. You know, recessing the buttons into the actual uh, clasp itself would have probably made it a much cleaner look. But having extensive wear time with this watch and, oh, it's just something else. This is, here we go, some photos from real life. One issue with it, of course, is the polished bracelet. Polished braces on the side, brushed in the center. Doesn't really bode very well unless you're wearing this every day and you scratch the hell out of it and it'll be fine. Um, it's so cool. I'm just going to jump over back to the comments. Let me find a good picture to pause on for you guys so long. Uh, I, yeah, I'm terrible. I can't multitask. I need, a, I need a team of people here like running the chat at the same time. Is this a, is this a 300? Yeah, this is not. This is a coaxial 300, not a vintage one. I, I mean, I, I don't really like this. The proportions of it just bug me on this on this modern version. The 57, on the other hand, just has that added touch. Here we go. Will they give us something good? There we go. Jumping back to the comments, let's have a look. Scratches are trendy, <laughs> absolutely. Now, the trilogy, the trilogy collection of watches are really something cool. I think they get a lot more hate than they deserve. I think for any of us who like like a designer, once again, a designer looking at this, I think it is such a cool blend of both worlds. It's kind of like a Singer Porsche in a way. You have this old school body, but at the same time, the, the components that run it are more modern than anything else. And all the while, uh, it's comfortable. I really wish they would bring sizes of watches down a bit. I'm not saying take it down from 40 to like 35, but I'm saying you know, drop it down to 38, play around with it, you know. Try and experiment a bit more. Um, geez, some of these photos are horrendous. You can never really find one that's perfect for viewing. Oh, that's a goodie. So the modern pieces, I th it says titanium. So I'm guessing this is a titanium blended piece. Would I choose the Black Bear 58 or the Trilogy? I'd take the Seamaster Trilogy any day. Even the Railmaster, I mean, that even that watch is, is something cool. Um, I don't know why. I have this fascination with Omega. Not talking about investment potential and buying and selling and all of that. I'm not into that stuff. 
as it is, I'm, I'm basically saving all my money for one watch that I really <clears throat> want to end off with, you know. Um, and I'll probably be going for some like something made of gold, something just to end it all with. But this watch just has Black Bear 58 or that. It's a very good question. I would take the Seamaster. I don't know why the uh, the vintage appeal to it just, just pulls me all the more. For someone who likes modern but also likes vintage, I think it fits nicely together. Um, very interesting. And I see something about slide on underneath. Oh, to adjust the length. Yeah, of course, it has that push that push to to expand, which is a nice touch. I mean, it's it's a nice attempt. Whether it's better than the the Rolex version, I don't know. It's it's pretty good, but the just the fit on the wrist, I think, is something to marvel at. 38 mils needs to become a trend. I mean, if I was designing a watch uh, for one of these big names, I would be going 38 mils, and I'm sure the market would go mad for it. Um, and once again, I mean, for the, for the price you're paying for these things, I mean, geez. And just talking about that, we're now going to jump to the new professional, the 2018. I don't think we'll be able to see... I don't think there'll be many examples here. I'll go into Google. Question, should I use Google more than Chrono? I don't know. I'm sort of just going to jump between the two. Um, Seamaster Professional 2018, since it was released then. This watch has garnered a lot of... Found a time this What is my Grail watch? I've been thinking long and hard about it, and, and my, uh, my thought is that if I want to buy... <clears throat> a really expensive watch. I mean, I've never bought a watch over a thousand pounds at this point in my life. I mean, that's that's the reality. I'm I'm saving my money. <clears throat> excuse me, saving my money, paying rent, living like a in in squalor, <laughs> in many ways, paying my way through life. When it comes to that final hurrah, that time to actually pick a watch, I wanted to be a Patek Philippe, I think, and I wanted to be in rose gold, maybe white gold, have an engraving on it. Um, because I, I'm wearing, as it is right now, I'm wearing a signet ring from my grandfather from the from the early 30s, 1930s, that could buy any steel Rolex sports watch that I would want. I mean, it's the the gold quality is is perfection, and I, I could quite easily take this and trade it in for a steel a steel Daytona, you know, if it was available, of course. But I really want something to mark that occasion and um i would go for something like a patek philippe something in gold something that i can engrave and wear whatever watch i want day to day but then have a patek you know 5196 for example i think they're just gorgeous watches i will talk about dress watches at a later stage um something to hallmark that moment you know uh thank you edward for joining have a good day hope you enjoy the rest of your day Lexa Dexa, may I ask your age? I was born in the early 90s, so I don't actually, I don't actually keep track of my age. I don't think it's healthy to know your, your, the, you know, the exact number. I'm 20, I think I'm 20, I'm 20, uh, 25. Yeah, I was born in 93. <clears throat> so I'm still a youngster, uh, you know, just finished university. Always had this as a passion in the back of my mind. And I wanted to, after studying design, uh, I wanted to bring out some kind of idea of being able to talk about the design of watches in more detail. Um, anyway, getting back on topic, talking about this watch, this new release. These are actually some awesome pictures. I don't. I think I should keep to um, Shashank Shakalua. Shash, I can't. I can't get your name. But I'm sorry. Um, you're also a '93. That's awesome. It's a good time. I'm just a pup. Exactly. I'm, I'm a youngster. I mean, I'm not experienced in this game at all but you know what i lack in experience um i hope to add a little bit of something here and there with uh, the design aspect talk a bit try and just hone in a bit more on elements that are seldom you know, not not unseen i mean a lot of these things are obvious but it's just uh really honing in on the stuff that irritates me personally but could be perfect for other people being an art director for three decades well, Scooby Dooby, <laughs> uh, I'd love to be in your position, that's for sure. Becoming an art director nowadays, it's so cutthroat. Um, am I South African? Helmut Rimmer. 
Yes, sir, I am. Very much so. <laughs> uh, this is so cool. Yes, and uh, Edward, Edward Chang, I'm going to be talking about the Blanc Palm just now. Uh, just finishing off with Omega. This is the last Omega, I promise. And uh, Thomas Burnett, a Patek's great choice. I, th I think it is. I would like to be able to just have the watch in my hand one day. I mean, just the money in hand one day. Be able to go into a boutique, Patek boutique, sit down and basically say, I'm, in, I'm interested in a watch. Say, I'll take it, put the money down, walk out. I've never been someone to buy anything on credit. Kanek Afrikaans Prat, a biki. I'm from Cape Town. Yes, sir, I am. Uh, I can, you know, I'm not the best Afrikaans speaker. I can understand it. Uh, studied it in school, but uh, it's not so good. Um, this is awesome. Schumacher. Talking about the, the Omega Schumacher by new. Or are you talking about something? Sorry, catching up here. So, talking about this watch, when it was released, it caught my attention. I said that in, a, in an old video. I never was much of a fan of the ceramic version of this watch because the bezel itself, you know, in certain lights fades. It doesn't really have that pop. At the same time, being offset, you know, having the date in the corner, um, the bracelet being more vintage style, a little bit more old school, didn't really appeal. So the new reference sort of caught my attention. I have yet to try on one of these newer references. There is a downside to this watch, and that's its size. And um, it's a bit of a problem. That's the one thing I sort of take away from it overall is that the, the proportions, you know, 42 millimeters uh, with a 20 millimeter case, like, sorry, 20 millimeter lug width is a bit of an issue. Uh, on the wrist, it does wear quite large. And if you have a small wrist, oh geez, this is the, how did that happen? How do you get an old school bracelet on a new version? Anyway, um, the watch does look like it wears quite large on the wrist, which is a bit of a problem. And having a no tapered, yeah, just, as, just as mentioned by Hans, having a no tapered bracelet is a problem. I'm a very eloquent, thank you, sir. <laughs> oh, geez, I'm just, I'm just doing my due, due diligence. Uh, thank you, that is that's one hell of a comment. And thank you all for joining and everything else. I don't even, 93 people watching now, that is superb, it's so nice. Um, yeah. I guess I'm quite a chatterbox and it's quite different to my uh, my normal video content because geez my recordings can sound dry as anything else but of course if someone's new you kind of need to keep the format very slow paced and eloquent with all the T's enunciated perfectly you know um, William J good afternoon thank you for joining us that is awesome um, found a times when you want a project or two in the watch industry as far as bringing designs to life Put money towards that first Daytona, reach out more. Oh, geez. A consultant, you know, I have an email address. Uh, I have about 30 emails that I haven't gotten back to. That's just how inundated I have been with stuff. It's a joke, actually. Once you hit a number, and, and again, I need to emphasize this to everyone uh, who hasn't heard, I have to thank you all for following my page because I'm still reeling after getting 5,000 people following me, okay? That is nuts, 5,000 people, but then suddenly 10. And, oh geez, let me get back to this. From going from 10 to suddenly having 11. 11 has just ticked over recently. Subscribers don't mean much at the end of the day, but the fact that you can actually appreciate it enough to follow me is, is really something. You know, it's always nice when your work is appreciated by people. I guess subscribers is a good way to gauge whether or not it is. Um, yeah, so, uh, call track. so talking about emails, I have about 30 unanswered emails at the moment. If anyone has emailed me, I'm sorry that I haven't gotten back to you. I've been trying to take a few days off because like I've said, over the last three months, I've put out about 40 videos and it definitely feels like 40 videos. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, each video takes between 10 and 12 hours to prepare. So it's a big portion of my day that I'm sort of factoring, oops, factoring, putting aside and uh, can be quite time consuming to say the least. So, so something about this watch, um, you notice that I'm actually focusing on the blue dial variants more. I think they've done something quite interesting with the blue dial model of this piece. I know this is just a factory, you know, stock photo, but we can sort of see the, the difference between these two watches. And um, they've done a lot of good improvements here. The wave dial, I think, is awesome. Ceramic dial that is, in fact, 
you know, with a wave pattern. It might look a bit cheap, you know, technically, chintzy, whatever, but as a manufacturing feat, I think it's really cool. Uh, moving the date complication down to the six, I mean, it's it's just symmetrical, balances it out. I am not a fan of the buttercup. The buttercup, um, the peanut buttercup helium release valve, it's got to go. And, and now, th at this point, uh, Cheetown, California, you're asking me, do I plan on critiquing more Seiko? Yes, I am. Uh, I'm definitely going to go into more of the Turtles and the other brands. All of these videos, I mean, there, there's so many topics to discuss within this realm. And, uh, yeah, it's just me. It's, it's time. Time is always the worst factor. Uh, sitting down and actually dedicating hours on end to a subject. As I was talking, as, as I mentioned earlier this week, I'm doing a video on the 5212 Patek Philippe that was released. Stunning, stunning watch. And I like to sort of like jump between. You know, we have Seiko the one week, Tudor, Rolex. Omega, Patek, Tag Heuer. I think that way, the 62 MAS, is that, is it the 62 or is it the 72? You're talking about the, the Blancpain um, copy, let's just say. Interesting history about the watch. I will go into that because one of the watches, I'm going to be talking about the Bartha Scaff at length and the standard 50 fathoms. We've been talking for over an hour already. I cannot believe it. Can you believe it? How am I actually still standing? <laughs> yeah, instead of just talking to myself, I'm talking to an audience for a change. Now, the 6.2 MAS is really cool. The Samurai, yeah. I'm going to be talking about all these pieces, slowly but surely. Um, perhaps a weekly, bi-weekly. Absolutely, Craig. Um, depending on how well this goes, whether you enjoy it. I'd like to hear your thoughts about whether you enjoy it or not. Maybe when the stream's over, you can comment below and tell me, whether you enjoyed it. I know it's a bit unorthodox that I'm not on the screen filming myself. <clears throat> and I think it's important. One thing I'd like to highlight is that I never wanted this page, <clears throat> excuse me, I never wanted this page to be about me. That's one thing that I really want to highlight. Um, I think there is enough, <clears throat> my voice is going, just taking a quick water substitute. Um, there is enough personality on this platform without me needing to be the personality too. And uh, I think what's more important is to just discuss the watches themselves. At least that's my, that's how I rationalize it. I'm more interested in talking about the subject of watches. I've just managed to spill water on my keyboard, so I hope it hasn't uh, fried it, but hey, it's all good. It's all good. Okay, next watch. We are going to be talking about Okay, so we're still talking about this watch. Sorry, I haven't even uh, finished on here. I have a feeling the stream is going to go on for another hour at least because there are a few more watches that we need to go through. This is a lot of fun. I'm really enjoying this. And no, I don't want to be a method actor. I, uh, I want to just be a guy, you know, be a, a quote-unquote symbol almost. Nothing, nothing as, a, as a person per se, just someone who talks about the design of watches. And I think, you know, one day I'll reveal myself, I'm sure. Um, there's a few people that know my name and everything else. I'm not like trying to hide all of that, but I mean, I think it's more important to talk about the watches and take the personality out of it because we've seen uh, so many, you know, people just get mean and nasty <laughs> at a certain point in time when when someone makes a bad decision, a bad call, like the Batman for watches. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> anyway. Talking about this watch again, they've done some they've done some great things with this piece overall. They've uh, the color is interesting, um, the blue is great. It does the nice thing about the blue is it plays very well in natural light. Some lights it's really bright and vivid, you know, like here. Other lights it sort of tailors down and looks more like black. If I was going for this watch, I would be getting the blue blue version completely. Mark Goldberg bought one of these pieces. Now this watch to me, oh, now this, this watch looks unfinished. You can let me know if I'm right or wrong. <laughs> this dial looks like they were just about to put the final lacquer of paint on and someone in the tool shop said, hey, I've got something here that uh, looks quite cool. You see how it plays with the light and how it reflects and they'll go, yeah, whatever, package it up, we make it a, another model. It it just doesn't complete its yeah it just doesn't complete the, the the image of the watch at all. 
it's the one watch that's really made me kind of oh doesn't appeal to me whatsoever but that is just my that's my take um and thank you hans channels and niche corner yeah i'd like it to be i'd like it to be you know it doesn't need to be a <clears throat> hundred thousand people it'd be great i mean geez having that kind of audience is awesome of course you, have, you need to have a responsibility then but i would like to focus more on the design of things and i know it's very um uh it's very niche in the sense i know a lot of people don't like this stuff they like talking about movement technicality and all of that i can't do that i'm not as advanced i'm not a rain man when it comes to movements i can talk about the fact that this coaxial movement is bar none one of the best movements that have come out of the swiss industry recently superb movement and talking about value for money again uh like we've seen with a couple of c masters this example is going to probably drop in value uh, when it comes to retail and geez if you want one entry level watch to get into the hobby i think this this could be an end all be all watch for someone um it's cool really sick looking thing uh, again i love the blue but one thing that I, i'm kind of on the fence of is with are the numerals on the bezel the numerals look way too big they look almost like something out of the 90s you can agree with me or disagree um, this is one channel that i love love watching watchbox is just great i mean tim tim is cool he has that like <clears throat> that sales persona around him so even when he's trying to be honest and like um you know trying to reach in and, and dig deep and talk from the heart he uh he likes to like talk about the sales elements of the watch and i find that very funny uh, also i'd love to meet the guy i'd love to actually sit if i could sit on the other side of the table and talk to him i think we would have such a blast that's just me you know i get along with anyone i love i love talking love learning okay the new c master is pretty cool it would have been better if they tailored it down to 39 mils. I would say 39 mils would have made this watch even more accessible because again, this is this watch is being targeted to the Asian market, you know, and we know that the Asian market's huge for these things. So tailoring it down because Asian generally Asian guys and girls don't have large wrists. Why not tailor it down to fit a bigger market? But then at the same time, they're making it big to also uh, add another factor to a different market segment being the larger people around with, with eight inch wrists and all the rest. So I think, yeah, between 39 and 40, that's what, that's what I mean. Uh, I think, I mean, it just looks, it looks huge. 42 mils is huge. And I've spoken about this a few times, but the allocation of space on a dial is very important. And the problem is when you walk, when you're working with a big dial, which I will be getting to now, when we talk about Blancpain, it's an issue. Uh, too big of a space on the dial causes a lot of problems. And it's just, just visually, it looks like, I mean, this is a perfect example. All that unused space you see inside here with, with the text, it sort of blends into the background and it's just a, a big slab. Okay, anyway, done enough talking about this watch. Now we're going to go on to Blancpain and talk about the 50 fathoms. I think a lot of people here have actually joined because of 50 fathoms. I, I remember it getting a lot of, you know, as it's gone through the algorithm and all the rest, more and more people have come onto the page because they like what I said about the 50 fathoms. And it is one of the greatest dive watches around. I don't care what anyone else says. I don't think you should really, uh, you know, love or hate it. It has, the heritage behind this watch is far greater than, than most. The fact that, and this is one little element that's important to highlight is that when Rolex was window dressing, you know, when their watches were still being sold in stores, these watches were being used by the military and had military application uh, all over the world. And that is pretty phenomenal. And remember, at this time, there was no real competition for these watches, apart from, um, you know, Rolex had their movements in Panerai, of course. But when it, come, when it came to dive watches with rotating bezels, I mean, this watch pretty much utilized the rotating bezel. The layout on the dial, it's kind of, uh, it's not very unique per se because, you know, Amigas have been using it and lots of other brands had, but it's something else. The modern incarnation, mm, I have a few issues with it. The, the 45 millimeter size, on one hand, it's great being a dive watch. Um, on the other hand, 
you know, you know it's easy and legible to, to use uh, when you are in fact using it as an instrument. But on the other hand, as an everyday wearing watch, 45 millimeters in size is ridiculously big. Um, stunning looking thing though. Really love the combination and everything else. And the hands, yes, mentioned by William J. The hands are very, so unique to the watch. Uh, I don't even, what would you call these hands? I'm trying to think. They're like pencil style, needle style. There is a name for them. <clears throat> Not Dauphine. There's so many. Dauphine, Alpha, you know, Breguet. There's such a range of hands. Anyway, but then there is one watch in the Blancpain family that I really want to make a video about. And uh, it's sort of nestling in this area. Oh, boy. So in, the, in tandem with the Hulk Submariner, a watch that I don't really don't really like for its color combination and choices. The 50 fathoms Bathyscaphe, this, this modern iteration is, mm. <laughs> it's a problem. <laughs> there, there, is a, there is a format to watch design. I mean, we've seen it, we've seen it time and time again. And it's, it's hard to differentiate yourself. We, we know that. I mean, when you see one, you see them all. But this piece, whew, as a dive watch, just bear in mind, uh, this is 38 mils, that's pretty cool. You're dealing with such a huge open space on a dial with tiny indices. And we were, there was mention about Seiko earlier. And let's just jump back to the history because it's quite fascinating. I'm going to go into Google. We look at the original Bathyscaphe. Um, let's just say vintage. So the idea, the story behind the, the, the original Bathyscaphe was it to be a watch that <clears throat> was accessible for more people because the 50 Fathoms was quite expensive. So they thought, let's try and make a more affordable 50 Fathoms. And this was the result. And if you know the history, I mean, it's a cool looking watch. It's pretty nice. You know the history about it. Seiko basically came in and brought out the 62 MAS as someone corrected me. I thought it was the 72, but it's the 62, you're right. And they pretty much replicated the Ibarthoscape. And if I jump between these two images, you see what the Seiko looks like. You see what the Bathyscaphe looks like. Where's a better photo? Hmm. Um, browsing, browsing. I'll find something. Hmm. It's always difficult when you're doing a presentation and you haven't, like, set up anything. Damn it. I had something here. This will have to do. You notice how the batons are placed and all the rest. Seiko pretty much used that same format for their watch. And from it came some exceptional watches like the Willard and all sorts of other pieces. It's a great, great story to cover. But this watch looks okay. No, it looks, it looks pretty standard. That's, and I think that's the problem. You know, you get to the stage where the watches look pretty much all the same. Are there any better high res? Here's an example. And of course, the pixelation, geez, this is why I hate using Google at times. Uh, but the issue is the, the new 50 Fathoms, Blanc Pond, 50 Fathoms, Bathyscaphe, the indices too small. Uh, the proportions, the balance does not work too well. I do like the fact that they've used a smaller bezel, adds that nice vintage touch to it, but overall, it doesn't look very good. So what I've said is that I love I, th I think you would be a fool not to love a, the, the 50 Fathoms as just, just through its, its history and its background. But the Bathyscaphe, we just see these two watches side by side. Oh dear, there we go, we're in. You see these two watches side by side. This watch understands proportion and balance a little bit better, wouldn't you say? This doesn't really, and the hands, of course, yeah, the, the um, I don't even know what you would call them. They're like needle style hands, but or syringe hands, I should say. They look very much like syringes. And there was a mention about the Blancpain using sword hands. Absolutely. This watch just has it so much better. So what Hodinki did in their new release that I'll have to open a new tab for because it's today announced. Um, let's see. And I will also have a look at the new Aorus that they released as well. So what Hodinki did was they pretty much Hodinkied it, as some people have said. They've taken the layout of the 50 fathoms and stuck it on the bathyscaphe. I mean, how difficult is that to do, really? <laughs> when you think about it, I mean, it's not like rocket science. And someone does have a good eye 
in the uh, in the Hodinkee lab to come up with that idea. I mean, it's, it's so basic. It's such a simple approach. They also added these little pencil. The pencil hands I'm not too keen on, actually. They look a bit weird. But, I mean, it's it's pretty much what the, the bathyscape needed to add a little bit of touch of interesting. But at the same time, have you seen the price of these watches? This is the best part. I nearly coughed up my, my tongue when I saw the price. So the, here's, their, here's their homepage. I mean, the, the PR and the marketing behind this is unbelievable. I must, I must really commend them for this. Um, it is stunning photography, really nice. But at the same time, I look at the watch and I kind of go, well, it just looks meh. You know, it's not, it's not really grabbing you and you know, holding on. They could have they could have fiddled around with the bezel a little bit more, maybe added some some more extreme knurling to the watch, for example. Uh, you know anything? Be interesting to see what if they had circular indices instead of rectangular ones for a change. Um, just play around a little bit more. But the hands don't really do it for me. They look a little bit too chunky, a little bit too out of place. It would be nicer if they'd stuck to sword styled hands. Anyway, so now we go down to. I'm sure there's a pricing here. And this, if you haven't seen, oh, there we go. There's the price of the watch. That made me cough out a little bit of blood. <laughs> that blows me away. I mean, it's it's a it's a watch on a sailcloth strap. Yeah. Enough said. I I'm not so much of a fan of limited runs. I think it kind of, uh, you know, Omega does it a lot, but their watches are at least attainable. I'm sure these have been all sold out by now. And you look at what the original 50 Fathoms looked like. I mean, that thing is just amazing. Bear in mind, like I said in the beginning of the stream, if you've been watching since then, bezels weren't very important things back in the day, but Blancpain had the foresight to emphasize bezels as the core element that the watch relied on, you know? Fascinating. Um, anyway, pretty cool. I saw mention about Fabertina. Yeah, the faux patina. I, I don't know. I I kind of like it. I'm 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 quite a sucker for faux patina. It has that the vintage look, but it functions like something modern. Uh, I'm not such a fan of having a radium paint on a watch just because you know it it degrades and uh, yeah, it's not. It's a nice touch. It's a nice look at least. It's a nice. It's not so contrasting. You know, it's a little bit more balanced in a sense. It's not so harsh on the eye. Anyway. So we've talked a lot about the 50 Fathoms. And now Oris, you might as well go into Hodinkee's Oris watch because uh, there was talk about this a while back. Now I really, I, I enjoy the, uh, the 65. Not so much of a fan of the bronze bezel, but the original 65 with the, the crazy numerals. I wonder if there's one around somewhere, maybe on Chrono 24. Let's look, <clears throat> Oris 65, oops. Don't know. This was quite an interesting watch. If we can find one, I think they are quite sought after. You know, the original 65, here we go, this guy. I find this to be quite a fascinating little piece because it is, it's so, it's so uh, linked to its original heritage. It has the same kind of layout, the same font, the same, and very quirky. I mean, it's, it's strange, strange, but at the same time, the negative space is really cool. When it's, when it's glowing in the dark, all you see are the highlights of the, the elements surrounding the numerals. It looks awesome. Um, so jumping now to Hodinkee's Oris. I don't even know if it is. A, is it a 65? Yeah, it is. I mean, all they did here was they just, um, what did they do? They took the date, they removed the date from the watch, added faux patina, <clears throat> took the aluminium bezel off, put it in bleach for about five minutes and put it back on. Now, uh, I don't know. Anyone can do that. <laughs> it's, it's a funny thing. <clears throat> Coming from my line of work, what I do, everything is hands-on, okay? So, like, if, if no one's going to do it for you, you do it for yourself. So I've bleached bezels in the past just for fun. It's such an easy thing to do. And to charge extra for a bleached bezel on a watch, it's nice. I mean, it, it has that vintage appeal, but uh, it's so easy, you know, when you think about it at, at length. 
hodinky it, I think is, is a very common term. And it's, uh, when I've seen how many limited editions they've released, it's mind blowing, actually. It's amazing. I mean, it's, geez, it's a dream for anyone in this, in this industry. But at the same time, mm, I don't know. It doesn't appeal to me much. It's too simple. It's too basic. Uh, that's not a bad thing. I mean, the proportions about this watch are great. I think, I think the watch's proportions are about 39 mils, if I'm not mistaken. May I look at the price? How cool is this? They even have a, geez, I haven't seen any of this. So um, just browsing through. I need to look at the comments too. Let's see. William J, looks like you're off. Yes, thank you for joining us. That was awesome. Really great having you on this evening. Um, pre pre jeans, exactly. I mean, I, I might be old school. I might be unfashionable, but I'm not a fan of ripped jeans, exactly. Uh, you know, jeans are meant to be things. Hey, that's a more reasonable price. Two, three, that's a bit better. But still, I mean, you're paying for a bleached bezel. So it's, uh, uh, it's difficult to really judge what, what people value and what people don't. Now, ripped jeans is another thing that I just don't, it doesn't, doesn't really appeal to me much unless you do it yourself, as in, uh, you know, you fall off your skateboard or your bike or whatever. Yeah. So uh, do I still have my Paul Newman Alpha? Yes, Alpha watches. I, I dig Alpha watches. I don't, I mean, how many other watches can you get that actually homage the Paul Newman Daytona? The Gevrol. I mean, will you be forking out 10 grand? I have no idea how much they cost now, but Gevrol is pretty much as close as you can get to getting a decent homage of a Paul Newman Daytona. And Alpha watches, they have some stunning stuff. I want to talk about chronographs in a, in a later video, maybe Friday or Saturday, if you guys are keen. Um, what was my opinion on Panerai? I was just about to look at it, Tom. Thanks for asking. Um, so, what I was going to look at the Breitling Super Ocean. I don't have much knowledge about the watch, but I think we could have a look at it briefly. Another watch that pays um, homage to its breathing. Nice. Can I spell Breitling? I don't know. We'll find out. Breitling Super Ocean. It's another watch that pays homage to its to its vintage counterpart. I think this is the 46 mil version. It's quite a nice looking watch. Um, Freddie Turner got you into off. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, the reality is how many people do you see walking around with a Paul Newman Day Turner nowadays? And I think if you can have your cake and eat it, why not just have some fun? I mean, watches at the end of the day are about fun. It's not about being snobs and everything else. Um, I think, you know, Alpha, Alpha watches have a brand, have a, a page in Europe. I think they're based in Europe, but they also, they've got a couple of web pages to source from. I'll talk about that at length. If we discuss chronographs, I'll go into that because it's, it's a watch I wear so often. I just beat it up. It's got a manual wind. I think it's got a seagull chronograph movement, manual wind. Superb. I mean, it's runs like a dream. It's so accurate. Such a lot of fun to wear. Have it on a Jubilee bracelet, and it's just absolute joy. Um, so yeah, talking about the, the Super Ocean again, it has a shark mesh bracelet, which doesn't, doesn't really appeal to me. But uh, it's an interesting watch. Once again, paying homage to fifties inspired pieces. Um, we know that the Pontiff, his Royal Pontiff, has worn a lot of these in the past. And, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't favor Breitling, but I think it is a pretty cool watch. Um, he enjoys them. I think we should enjoy them. They're pretty cool. But I don't know, I don't know if the movements are ETAs in these pieces or if they have in-house movements. I think they teamed up with Tudor, if I remember right, and they're using Tudor-based movements. I don't know. I don't know the full story about these watches. I do need to look more into... Uh, these pieces and study up on them a bit more if I want to do a write-up. would be nice to go into the history briefly about these watches, I think, because they do have quite a nice history. I really dig the, the font. Super Ocean in that cursive font looks great. Typeface font, whatever you want to call it. Wow. So this is great. The, the chat is just amazing, guys. I wish I could just like focus on the chat and talk, but now, I'm trying to like get through all of this stuff. So let's just, I'll try and be a bit more brief for the rest of these because we are, I think we've just passed an hour and a half. I don't think I should exceed um, two hours on this discussion. <laughs> My voice is probably going to be gone by the end, but what the hell, this is fun. Panerai, a watch that um, I really need to 
discuss at length in a future video. Just running through the history, its heritage, maybe a bit of whiskey will help clear up the throat. <clears throat> okay, so we're going to look at the radiomere first, which is the, uh, the icon of the brand. But as we know, Panerai, you know, had such a, a big story, a big history behind them. Their, uh, their watches in, are steeped in history. It's just a, sh a pity that um, they've, <laughs> they've dropped back so much over the years. But the, the Radio Mirror was the original, you know, the OG with, with the Rolex movement inside it. And, um, you know, it's cool. It, it's great for people with big wrists. I mean, again, this watch is measured at 45 millimeters in diameter. So for my wrist, wouldn't work. But what I do appreciate, if this watch was 36 mils, it would wear like um, <laughs> purely medicinal. Yeah, Hans, it is. It really is good. Um, if this watch was 36 millimeters in diameter, or 38 maybe, the, the cushion case would take up a lot more space, and the watch would probably wear more like a 40. But as it is in 48, 45 millimeters, it's huge. But the bonus is that eight-day power reserve. I think that's awesome. I think it's really awesome um, with, an eight, with, with that idea of being able to charge the, the watch up once on a, on a Sunday night and wear it all week without worrying. I mean, that's cool. I've owned a couple of mechanical watches in the past, and uh, a long power reserve makes it all the better. Some of these pieces are interesting. This is also, this is also an eight-day power reserve with the automatic. Um, you know, it's a bit conflicting. We look at the, uh, where am I? We look at the dial, we look at the numerals. I mean, they look great. It's very iconic. I do enjoy, geez, give me a proper pixelated picture, please. Is that all I ask for? Something clear, come on. Okay, that'll have to do. The sandwich dial is very nice. Uh, the idea that the whole, the tritium plot, uh, no, originally the tritium plot was underneath and you would have the dial placed on top of it. I think that's a very interesting approach. Um, it's definitely novel, and it, and it plays to what Panerai are known for. But it is also very dated. And if we jump now to the Luminor, for example, this is more of a, of a watch that screams Panerai. I think this is a really sick-looking piece. The, the thing that makes it is that registered crown guard. It looks awesome. I mean, um, details, it really looks stunning. That crown guard being, you know, the fact that it's not a screw in crown and it's held solely down by, by a spring tension uh, onto the pusher, I think it's great. It's a really nice touch. And I mean, they offer a lot for what they're giving you, but at the same time, again, these watches are just too big. It was in fashion in the 90s, as far as I know. I was barely alive then. But... Um, yeah, these watches, it's a pity that they've gone the way they have. I think if they wanted to improve the brand, they should once again bring the sizes down a bit, make them a bit more for the everyday person instead of having them as tool watches. There is a famous um, South African explorer. I think it was Watchbox who did a video. I didn't even know his name, uh, but he's, he's in partnership with Panerai and he wears the watches all over the world. He goes sailing and goes mountain climbing. Never heard of the man before, but uh, very interesting story. Watchbox has some interesting interviews to look at. And I think they do. Uh, who's a rooted, <laughs> rooted rotor? Love your name. Uh, do they have some 40 millimeters or 42 millimeter? I think they do. I think they do. I'm not knowledgeable enough to, to know that yet. I need to study up a lot more on Panerai. I mean, you know, you can be the rain man of practically any watch out there. It just takes a couple of couple of years to, uh, or a couple of months to learn the details. Um, anyway, enough of Panerai. How many, we have, we have, how many more do we have left? Technically, we have two more left. And this one, I think, actually, I'll, this will be the last one for the day, or the last two. Let's see. I'm going to look at Longines, a watch that many people hate the test. But there's one watch, just from a design point of view, that I really, really like. And it's the Heritage Diver. Um, the compression case is something very anachronistic, very to its time. And I think this watch does it so well. I mean, it's, I'm pretty sure it's an almost an exact replication of the, uh, 
it's the legend diver. Yeah, that's it. Sorry. Um, it's got that, that tie to what it used to be like back in the day, very similar to the 57 Omega in a way. And I think it's just fascinating having the bezel inset on the dial. I think it's so cool. You know, you, you have it, you have it all there. You're protecting the bezel. The longevity of the bezel is increased. It's a pity that not more brands do it nowadays. I think this is the original. Wow. How cool is that? So here's an original on a dis distressed leather strap. How nice is that watch? Stunning looking dive watch. And again, it doesn't look like a dive watch. You know, that's the best. I think that's one of the best parts about watches. If you know watches enough, you know uh, what is a dive watch, what isn't a dive watch. And to the uninitiated, I think it's so cool having a watch that doesn't say, it doesn't express what it does on first glance. You know, it starts a conversation. I think they're always the best. And the final watch that I want to go through is just that. It's one of my favorite watches, and it's probably going to surprise you a lot because it's definitely not typical. Uh, come on, let's find one more good picture of this piece. There aren't many of them, sadly. Here's a tropical old piece. They're very, very interesting pieces. I'm just reading through here. Big Eye priced itself out of the market. Less busy. Hydro Conquest. Short giants. Ripped jeans. <laughs> Guys are just having a laugh in the chat. Okay, so yeah, really dig this piece. I think it's very interesting. So unique and different, and it would be awesome. I know Helson. Helson does an excellent version of this watch. I think Bruce Williams did a video about it a while back. I think it's the Helson Shark Diver or something. I was actually looking at it the other day. It's a stunning looking watch. Um, the ETA movement, the proportions, I think the size, once again, you bring the size down from 42, utilize that architecture, that space inside the dial, which is really important, uh, makes such a difference. And last but not least, talking about compression cases, I sort of ended off with this for a reason. This watch to me is just the ultimate cool. And you might be very surprised. Uh, let's see if they even have any. I hope they do. Not PLC. I love autocorrect text. They only have one left, and it's in rose gold. This watch to me is so cool. I'm interested in hearing your thoughts on this uh, when we when we get there. I'm watching the stream. The stream's like three seconds delayed, so yeah, it's quite cool. I get to see it in the slow motion. So this watch, this is the Jager Lecoutre Master Compressor Memo Vox. <clears throat> so what does it do? It's a compression, compression diver, compressor diver, but at the same time has a Memovox function. It is, it is quite busy, I'll admit. It is quite technical, but I think I prefer, I like the function more than anything else. So you have that, you can adjust the bezel with this crown on the side here, but at the same time you can set Memovox. So not only are you diving, you're also being able to, you can read the readout on the bezel, but then also have an alarm to alert you when you're coming up, when you need to come out. <laughs> AC3 horns turn 45 degrees. <laughs> That's going to be one of the best comments this evening. Um, I, f I find it fascinating. Uh, maybe it's not, I mean, it's, it's very to its time. I think this piece was in the early 2000s and they killed off these watches. And I really wish if I was designing for JLC right now, <laughs> I, would, uh, I would go with one of these pieces. I would use this case design, should I say. I think the compressor crowns are fascinating. Uh, the story behind the Memovox and, uh, and the compressor, that the thousand hours, it's just it's a really cool little bit of history, even comes with a deployment. Um, have you seen the article on a blog to watch, David Brennan? No, I haven't. I will have a good look at that. Thank you for suggesting. Uh, but JLC, I, I dig JLC. I think of all the watches, you know, if I had to choose a few brands that I really enjoy, I enjoy Amiga. JLC, Patek Philippe. Those three are really awesome watches, not just for what you're getting, but you know, the history, the, the, the pricing. I mean, the nice thing about JLC watches is that their watches are fairly affordable in the scheme of things, depending on what you're looking for. Uh, let me see if I can find some better pictures of this member box. They're very few and far between. Let's have a look. Monster compressor member box. <laughs> The, the issue about the, there's an issue with this watch though, and that it is 40 millimeters, 42 millimeters in size. Again, it's a bit oversized, which is an issue. 
Um, je know, the je know controversy. Yes, I have, a, I have an email that I need to reply about that too. I've actually been asked for my opinion on the controversy. I've had an interesting history with Juno. Uh, I'll talk about it. I don't know, I should make a video about it for sure. But, um, you know, reading through that article, I, I did page through that article completely and it looks so verifiable, it's scary. The thing is that on the same, on the same time, I've had a, I, I, this, this channel started with the Juno Ocean Rover, believe it or not. And let's actually pull one up since we're talking about it. Might as well just get one. I'll open up a new Google tab to have a look at quick. I'm so on the fence with this watch because I still own it. I, I wear it practically every few days. For a watch that homages a mil sub, I don't think you can get better. Okay, this is not marketing. I'm not, um, I'm not gonna bash anything or anything else, but I'm just gonna say how I feel about it and that this watch is, it's so well finished and everything else. The, the experience I've had with the actual company is that there was a time when one of the indices came off the watch. I was wearing it on a very hot day and one of the indices managed to pop off the watch. I was one of the early adopters. I have one of the prototypes of the piece. And um, I, I went onto the Facebook page. I tried emailing, but it wasn't fast enough. I went onto the Facebook page. I requested uh, what I should do. And John McMurty, we don't know who he is exactly, but he said, package it up, send it off to this address in Germany, get it fixed. And the customer service was brilliant. No, didn't have to pay, free of charge. I had the watch serviced, I had the dial fixed, I had this little indice replaced, put back. The watch came back polished and brushed and everything perfect again. So it's difficult. Now, I, from, from my background, I've had a good, very good customer service with the brand. But at the same time, seeing what's been coming out lately, I don't think anyone can, can go around saying that they, you know, they're someone else. I don't appreciate that much but I do enjoy the watch. So it's very, it's very conflicting. I mean, I've, I've used ETA powered watches in the past. I've heard now that this is a most definite, like a Chinese ETA clone. Um, but again, the nice thing about being an early adopter was that I didn't spend a lot of money on this piece. Uh, I only, I think it was, it was half price if you were going to do a review of it. That's, that's how this whole channel started. And that's why I kind of want to make a, a, a proper video about it. Um, the channel started because of the Juno Ocean Rover. I found it when I saw it, I was like, absolutely, I need to try this out. And uh, yeah, long story short, we will all definitely discuss it. I would like to make a proper statement about Juno and what I think. I'm very much on the fence. Not happy that it's been unveiled this way. That's for sure. As far as I knew, I mean, I even got to a point when I was asking them if they would like some design help, like if they were interested in a, any kind of design collaboration in the future. I emailed out to them saying, if your team would like someone to help you with the design, come on, give me some good quality, damn it. Um, I would be happy to help with your design team. And that's as far as it went. And as far as I knew, they were based in Los Angeles, not Los Angeles, in Las Vegas. Um, it all checked out, the addresses, everything was superb, packaging was great. So it's difficult. I'm definitely going to do a talk about this in the future. Anyway. Getting back to the master compressor, I'm sure the comments are now going mad. Rooted Rota, I love your name, Rooted Rota. To Germany, yeah, exactly, to Germany. There was this Yassin, um, it was, he was a watchmaker in Germany. His name, I think I actually have a, I have a video of it on the page somewhere. Uh, his name was Atelier Dolphin and he was a, a watchmaker. And it was less than a week, the watch went from the UK to Germany, didn't have to pay postage, didn't have to do anything was done returned to me no cost watch came back perfect and that to me is excellent customer service i was chuffed i mean i wrote i made a video about it but at the same time hearing this news is kind of leaves a, leaves a bad taste in your mouth i say anyway um going back to the compressor the last watch of the evening i mean we're approaching the two hour mark i think my voice is going to disappear if i want to do another one of these on friday i'm going to have to like rest my voice um, stunning, interesting, I would say more than anything else, this, this master compressor is an interesting watch. Um, very interesting combination and I wish they still had it out today. But uh, yeah, it's one, of the, it's one of the strangest looking watches out there and the one issue with it 
is that the, the case is 42 millimeters. So on a small wrist, like in this example, it looks a little bit strange, way out of proportion, which is a problem. That's one of the issues with these cases, with these uh, inset bezels on these compressor cases. Um, are they COSC certified? I'm just running through. See, it's, <laughs> the sign is simply bad. Alexander, that is a good statement to make. I, uh, I don't know. Sometimes, and this is a weird thing about designers, sometimes we just get drawn to the strangest of things, and I would say this qualifies. It's a bizarre-looking watch. Um, I'll get the wine in if you do a Friday stream. Hans, I yeah, I will. I'll, I'll be doing wine on Friday, I think. Whiskey is cool, but, um, you know, wine is better. I don't know. I can't remember the, the quote. What was it? Whiskey is – wine is quicker. I don't know. I can't remember. Whiskey is quicker. Anyway, uh, geez, how many more watches can we talk about? There's there's so many dive watches. <clears throat> I hope you've had your fix on dive watches this evening. And I will most definitely talk about Jeannot in an upcoming video. I've got so many topics to discuss. Uh, if I'm just if I just look through my notes quickly, let me just find a nice picture to look at. We can talk a little bit more about Jeannot while we're at it. I'll be interested in knowing your thoughts because I'm sure a lot of people own them too. And... Uh, I'd like to hear your, your experiences about the watches too, because mine so far has been excellent. Hearing this news has been quite a quite a hit. Um, just running through my notes, upcoming videos, what do I have? I have a video about FP Jean that I haven't touched in a long time. The new Patek 5212, the Lunga 1, Vacheron Overseas, Cartier Santos. <sighs> There's so much. There's so many discussions to have on these pieces. But... Um, Whiskey is, yeah, wine is fine, but whiskey is quicker. Thank you, Rich Buddy. That's the one. Yeah, getting a bit tongue-tied. This is this is hour number two. Is it? Hour 51. Yeah, I think I'm going to close it off coming up to now. But, geez, it's been, it's been awesome. It's been so nice just having a dialogue. I think I'll pull up one more. Let's just pull up a uh, the epitome of what I think Rolex dive watches are which is the sea dweller, just as I read through the last of the comments. Um, yeah, so there is, there is so much to talk about. I hope you've had your fix of dive watches. I wanted to try and keep it dive watch specific tonight. Um, but I hope you have enjoyed it. It's been a lot of fun, been a great change. It's weird not having anyone online. You know, I should invite people on to have discussions with, but... As it is right now, I don't know how to do any of that stuff. I'm just being honest. This uh, Apparently, the, the format of this page is changing very soon. Um, apparently, Google is not going to be a part of the live streaming service anymore, and YouTube is taking the reins, so I'm going to have to learn a whole new format of how to run live streams in the future. Yeah, Just talking about this, the Sea Dweller, I, I spoke about this in the beginning. It is, it is such a killer-looking watch. It's got that understated factor that just makes it look like a normal Submariner, but under the hood, it is amazing. 15,000 meters for diving. If diving watches, yes or no. <laughs> exactly. I mean, I uh, the furthest I've ever gone, I have dove or dived before. Furthest I've gone is about 20 meters. And that's with, that's with a tank. That's with everything else. 20 meters is hella far. I mean, anyone going further than that, it's, you know, it's crazy. I, I, know, I actually have a friend. Who, uh, who dives religiously, and she's had some crazy experiences with guys who come up with uh, bubbles in the brain and all of that, that whole story. You know, when you mix, when you mix diving and when you go too deep and you don't uh, surface, the mind blow. Anyway, guys, um, I think I will now pan across back to the ID Guy Live. It's kind of strange, kind of strange looking icon for a desktop screen, but... Thank you. I did, I did not mention the Planet Ocean, Gerard. I think I should. Jeez. There's, there's so much to talk about soon. I, I need to do another one of these talking just about dive watches. But I'd be interested in knowing if you'd like a live stream on Friday talking about chronographs. Whether it's Friday or Saturday, I'm kind of on the fence. Um, I don't want to get in the way of other channels that I know like to do their streams on Saturday. Um, kind of thinking... Friday might be a nice time. Just talking about chronographs now, since we've done dive watches to death almost, and then run through the, the Speedmaster, talking about the, uh, the controversy that I pulled up the other week. 
Um, yeah, but it's been a lot of fun. You guys have been great. It's been awesome reading your comments. I haven't been very, haven't been very quick with the replies, but I hope you have enjoyed it tonight. And yeah, I don't know how to, I don't know how to end this. So I'm just going to open this. I think you have to stop sharing the screen. Okay. We're getting somewhere. And, uh, Friday should be good. I think I will, I'll make a schedule. I think this time around this time on Friday would be good. It's an issue that I can't reach out to America and everywhere else at the same time. It's a pity that we're not all on the same time zone, but thank you guys. Thank you so much for joining. Uh, really all of you guys who are commenting, I have to, once again, just thank you all for subscribing to this page. I mean, 10,000 was now all of a sudden it's 11,000 people and, uh, all the comments you leave insightful, exciting. I mean, I dig it. I read through everything, but I just can't put two hours aside to, as you can tell, I'm quite long winded when I speak, you know, I'm very different on a live stream as I would be doing these, these authorized videos that I, you know, write out and, and record. So. Once again, thank you all for tuning in this evening. I think we're just about to approach the two hour mark. We might have passed it five minutes to go. Um, I think I'll cut it here for the evening or the morning or the afternoon, wherever the hell you are in the world. So thank you all for joining. Have a superb evening, morning or afternoon. And I hope to have a video out or another live stream out on Friday. I think I'll take a break from videos this week. Just enjoy doing this for a while. This is sort of like my quote unquote holiday. <laughs> Three, you know, three months and 40 videos it does a lot to you. <laughs> anyway, thanks a lot, guys. Thank you for tuning in. All the best from London. I'm in the South. Hans, thank you very much for joining. Everyone, have a great evening and see you in the next one. Cheers.